Thank you so much for being here tonight. I'm Suzanne Sparge. I'm the director of 516 Arts. We're a non-collecting contemporary art museum. And um, the current exhibitions are all about the US-Mexico border. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about it. But first, I'd like to welcome Rachel Pablo. She's the curator here at 516 Arts and curated the exhibition upstairs. And she's going to do a land acknowledgment. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Rachel Pablo. I am from the Dene Nation. I am, a, I am of the Red Running Into the Water Clan, which is Tachitni, born for the, um, where the water comes together clan, which is um, Toedlini, for whatever reason, I'm really nervous now. And um, my maternal grandfather is Sinji Kene, which is the Honeycomb Cliff Dwelling People's Clan, and my paternal grandfather is Oschi, which is the Red Bottom People Clan. And, um, you know, I, I just want to, um, from the heart, sincerely, like, um, be authentic in this land acknowledgement because, you know, it comes under um, as performative. And as a indigenous um, woman, from New Mexico, from the Southwest, you know, they, we are on the lands of the Tiwa people. And I'm from the Dene Nation. I'm even a visitor upon these grounds. So I just kind of want to bring that consciousness that, the, you know, the Tiwa people, the Puebloan people, that um, they're caretakers of the land and um, kind of going off of um, board member. Roger Frawa He's from here the tonight. oh the Hamis oh hi Roger I should have had you do this <laughs> <laughs> and, um, that you know it's of the birds the land the trees the water all of these living elements here and that um, that it's just the caretaking of this whole area collectively but um, just to be conscientious of all of that. I think that is it, and thank you for being here. Thank Thanks, Rachel. Thank you so much, Rachel. And yeah, our board member, Roger Frago, is here from Jemez Pueblo. Thank you for being here. Um, so this project and tonight's talk came about through our regional collaboration that's called Deserto Mountain Time. And there's 14 uh, like-minded organizations that are working together throughout the region about issues of shared concern and um, shared values. So this exhibition downstairs, Migratory with Minerva Cuevas and, uh, Cuevas and collaborators, was developed in El Paso and Juarez and exhibited at the um, Rubin Center for the Visual Arts. And Carrie Doyle, the director, is here tonight as well. But working with Carrie and the Rubin Center really made it possible to bring it here to Albuquerque. And um, each panelist can speak to a different aspect of this project. Um, some of our panelists tonight are going to be talking about the development of migratory and um, what that means. Some are here representing um, law and uh, immigrant organizations here in Albuquerque. So. It's going to be a really fascinated, fascinating conversation. I'm really happy to have Re Rebecca Schreiber here, professor in American Studies, to lead the conversation. She really instigated us to bring it, the exhibition here and to um, have this conversation tonight. So um, without further ado, I do, I'd just like to thank our staff as well, Kevin and Claude and Daniel and Viola and um, Rachel, of course, and Joni for all their work, and, um, and you'll, I think you're in for a treat with tonight's discussion. So thank you, and I'm going to hand it over to Rebecca. OK, thank you so much, Suzanne. Um, I've, I've been told that we need to have the mic right up to our, to our mouths, and we have two. So I'm going to hand one to Jessica. Um, I'll just start by um, saying, you know, I wanted to say thanks to um, 516 Arts, to Carrie Doyle, 
um, to everyone who was involved in bringing this project here to Albuquerque. I think we're really lucky to have this work here. Um, I, I'm, I'm just so grateful. I know a lot of people were involved in, in the exhibit. And if you haven't seen the exhibit yet, um, either you know we might have a little time at the end of the panel for you to check it out or come back another time when 516 is open, it's free. And um, there's another exhibit upstairs, which we'll, we'll be discussing today. Um, again, as Suzanne said, my name is Rebecca Schreiber. I'm a professor of American Studies at UNM, where I teach classes on immigration, migration, and also on visual culture. So uh, I was extremely excited to see this show um, at UT El Paso uh, in the spring. And I wanted to, when I found out that it was going to be coming to Albuquerque, I wanted to put together a panel to have, um, to provide some context about, about the exhibit. Um, I was fortunate enough to be here for the opening and I got to hear again, Carrie Doyle, um, the director of the Ribbon Center, uh, converse with Minerva Cuevas. Um, and for those of you who were not able to make it, I think that that video is available. Uh, through 516 Arts, but that was a really wonderful conversation, and I'm hoping that today we can add to, to that. Um, so I'm just going to have all the panelists introduce themselves, and then we'll then I'm going to ask them some questions, so they can share with you um, either their involvement with the exhibition or to provide some context about. Um, the moment in which this exhibition was put together, which um, was was quite was quite challenging, so we we will get to that, and then we'll also uh, have some presenters who will talk about the current context for asylum seekers um, in El Paso and those coming to Albuquerque, and also um, what we can do in Albuquerque to support this work. So I think we'll just kind of go down and start with. Jessica, if you don't mind um, introducing yourselves, tell us tell us about you and um, Albuquerque FaithWorks. Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm not on. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Um, my name is Jessica Corley, and I'm the executive director of Albuquerque FaithWorks. And we are a program that um, assists asylum seekers residing here in Albuquerque, not folks passing through, but people who have settled here in Albuquerque, and we provide a variety of different services, and I'll be talking more about that as we go on tonight. Hi, uh, my name is Juana Estrada Hernandez, and I am one of the artists that has been included both in the migratory show, but also when the dogs stop barking upstairs. I am a assistant professor of printmaking at Fort Hayes State University an artist, printmaking artist, and a uh, current DACA recipient. Hi, I'm Edgar Picasso Merino. I'm the director of uh, Azul Arena, which is an organization in Juarez and El Paso that focuses on uh, promoting the arts and culture on both sides. Um, I was involved in the uh, research and development of uh, the migratory pages and also in the production of the exhibition at the Rubin Center. Good evening. I'm Carol Suzuki. I teach at the University of New Mexico School of Law. One of the courses that I teach is the Community Lawyering Clinic, where students represent clients in immigration and other matters. The law school is the closest law school to the El Paso Immigration Court, and as you probably know, it is the only law school in this state. Is this working? Yeah, okay. Okay, thank you all for your introductions. Um, I, I think we're going to start with Edgar, and in part, um, people may be curious about these yellow books um, that we're, we have here. Um, Edgar, as he mentioned, was involved with the ex exhibition of Migratory when it was at the Rubin Center for the Visual Arts at UT El Paso, and he worked with the artist Minerva Cuevas. Um, who lives in Mexico City to help put together um, the exhibition and also the yellow pages. We have one from, from Albuquerque that's new, but this one was, um, was created uh, for the exhibition in El Paso. So um, Edgar, could you talk a little bit about how you 
helped Minerva Cuevas um, with the exhibition, with the yellow pages, and um, just what that what that process was was like. Yeah, definitely. So um, I've been collaborating for a couple of years with Gary Doyle at the Rubin Center um, in different exhibitions and different projects. Um, so um, I got invited to um, help Minerva Cuevas in the middle stages of the project um, in the fall of last year. Um, I think like after some time of like, you know, postponing the exhibition and not knowing what was going to happen be because of the pandemic, it was time for, uh, you know, have work in the exhibition and have Minerva come and visit uh, the border. And I got reached out to um, help her uh, do um, a little bit of research in the city. So um, at this time, it was just, you know, like a, a, a role of, of helping her get through uh, the, uh, the, the Juarez community that was helping the migrants. She came from Mexico City with a list of groups she had, like, you know, uh, highlighted that eventually could be part of the uh, yellow pages that we, uh, created as a team in Juarez and El Paso. Um, so um, she uh, came to Juarez and she was there for a whole week, um, beginning with this list that she had and we you know, uh, started going over it, what would be the best way of you know, approaching these people or just to meet them. And there was like nothing uh, set on stone on, on what we were expecting from those meetings. I think that Minerva is really careful about you know, creating this like trust relationships with the uh, community that she's working with without really you know, like having to feel like it's like a transactional thing, you know, like, oh, like I need this right away or like, so it was more like, you know, getting to know people and understand what the needs and the situation was in Juarez. So we spent maybe around seven days or eight days um, talking to uh, different artists that are involved in helping migrants, also different like, you know, international organizations that uh, came to Juarez um, once um, 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 more migrants starting like settling in the city. Um, also, like a lot of uh, local um, groups, uh, a lot of uh, churches that were opening um, shelters, and people that were just like doing work um, uh, to alleviate uh, the the stay of migrants and or asylum seekers in in, in Juarez. So, um, the process was pretty um, pretty interesting to see. Um, you know, like I'm I'm used to. Uh, uh, when people come over to Juarez or El Paso, I'm used to like them, you know, being on a roll of like, you know, I need to do this, I need to meet these people, I need to get this right away. But with Minerva, it was like a very different uh, kind of like, you know, community building. She would take the time to talk to someone and actually, you know, like try to create a connection and then like naturally move from there. You know, like she had a list, but then we began with a couple people that I knew who they were. So we went to them first and then from there, you know, like they started saying like, oh, you should talk to this person, you should talk to this other person. So we started. Um, kind of like discovering this network of people that have been working in Juarez, many of them for, you know, like decades, and many of them that had just arrived um, to help with the different social issues that we have at the border. Um, so that was uh, pretty much like the, the first part of it. Uh, when uh, we never went back to Mexico City, um, I got invited to help with a production of the exhibition that she had in mind. I feel like during this time when she was uh, visiting the border, she um, got some ideas to incorporate local artists to be part of the exhibition. And um, I was part of that process of, you know, like facilitating the um, uh, communication and the process of creation of like certain aspects of the exhibition, including the, um, the mural or like the mosaic that you see in the back, which was done by uh, George Perez. Um, you know, I helped him a little bit in, the development of that uh, uh, mosaic, you know, like by doing the grid and then like talking to another artist, his name is Israel Gomez, who did the structures, like the, the woodworking part of the exhibition, you know, like um, coming up with sizes and, 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 and like trying to bring um, Minerva's um, um, vision of what she wanted to have in the exhibition um, in collaboration with local artists. Um, the exhibition opened um, early in the spring, if I'm not mistaken. mistaken. Um, the, uh, migratory Yellow Pages was not ready until like a couple months later. So after the exhibition opened, um, I was part of the team that uh, was in charge of developing the book. Um, that meant, you know, um, uh, uh, really like thinking about like the most ethical and safest way of including information that was going to be provided for people that are in like very vulnerable uh, situations at the moment. So, you know, there was like this, um, a lot of fact checking, uh, relying on these, uh, network that exists that we saw within the community to make sure that the information that we were putting out 
was actual, you know, like factual and, and, and safe and, and, and reflective of what was actually going on on the field. Um, so we uh, worked as a team, you know, with, uh, with Minerva, but also with a lot of people that um, helped us with all this fact checking and, you know, uh, creating the content that was provided in the book. Um, ultimately, the book was uh, published um, without, um, you know, the decision was made to, be, to have it published without authorship. Um, even though now we know, like at this moment, like you know who was part of the team that was involved in it, but like I think it was very important for the team uh, to make sure that we're putting out this information without taking um, um, ownership of stuff that didn't belong to us, because like pretty much what we were doing was just like highlighting or compiling the information that's already like available within the community in a in an object that would be just easy for migrants to use and digest, you know. So. Um, that decision was made. I think it's also, um, um, I learned a lot from, from that process of, you know, like working with a community and, and not taking advantage of the community or the resources or the information and knowledge that a community has when you're creating an artistic project. So I, th I think that was one of the things that were um, the most important in terms of the development of this uh, project. Thanks so much, Edgar. I'm I'm hoping that if would someone mind? Um, I'll I'd like to just pass this around. This is in the exhibition, uh, the version that was created for um, El Paso and Juarez. But for those of you who haven't had a chance to take a look at it, um, if we could just have it get passed around a bit there, uh, and there is an Albuquerque version as well that we'll we'll get to. So. Um, Edgar, I'm just wondering if there if there's anything else you want to add just about the the kind of challenges of creating the exhibition and so forth um, during the pandemic uh, with certain um, laws that were put in place. Um, here I'm thinking about Title 42. I mean, just if there's anything else that you want to reflect on the challenges in terms of the process of putting together the exhibit. Um, I um, I would like to mention that this was like covered in the previous conversation between Kerry and Minerva. I was like talked a little bit more in detail about that. Um, I was not part of the curatorial team behind the exhibition. I was more part of like the production team. Uh, but in terms of the book, and it was like one of the previous questions that you sent me that we might talk about. You ask uh, how these programs affected the production of the migratory yellow pages, and I was thinking about the fact that the reason the book exists or like, it's, it's like a response to those programs that were put into place by, by, by the US government. And um, in reality, it was not like, you know, I mean, it, um, we were reacting to like the results of those programs. So, you know, the, 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 the book, um, um, I don't think it was like, you know, like I can't think of like a negative effect that those programs had just because of the fact that it was like a result to that. Yeah, so it's, it's, it was interesting to think about that fact. Um, one thing too that I, I was also like thinking about is that um, the fact that information was changing so quickly at the moment in terms of like, you know, those uh, programs and, you know, like decisions were, ma were being made in like different courts and, you know, like the federal system was, you know, reacting in different, min so when we were talking to the people that were like on the field and people that were helping people like, uh, like in, in the, uh, that were like uh, tr trying to seek asylum. Um, what they t told us all the time is like, we don't know what's going to happen. You know, we don't we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. We don't know. Like, I mean, everything could change in a moment, and you know, we can like start seeing more people. All of a sudden, like, no one's coming. So it was like this like weird idea that everybody had that they were just reacting to um, these decisions that were being made in the U.S. that were like immediate, and they had to you know like try to figure out what was happening. Um, as, as they went. Um, so, I mean, that reflects itself in the, in the fact that, you know, there's like maybe a lot of information that we couldn't put out in the book because we had to understand the fact that this um, um, uh, circumstance was changing on a daily basis. So, like, you know, we had to make sure that like the information that we put was not, you know, something concrete where we could like misguide people to what they could, you know, uh, uh, that what the process could be like. So, you know, we, we made sure to talk to a couple of people that were lawyers that worked within organizations to kind of like create a language that was informative, but also that left people understanding that 
these things were changing like pretty often. So I mean, that's that's a couple of things that come in mind when thinking about those programs. Thanks so much. Um, I think if we could um, hand the mic to Juana, I was going to ask you a little bit, um, you to talk about the artworks that uh, of yours that are included in this uh, exhibit. Um, some people in the audience probably have seen um, your work, uh, both um, in the migratory exhibit as well as the exhibit upstairs. If you could kind of share a bit about um, about how you became part of this exhibit and what, what you wanted to contribute, and then also the work upstairs. Uh, so to begin, um, the way that I got involved with the migratory exhibition was simply I saw, like there was an open call for submissions for both like literary um, information, visual information, um, and so the way that I contributed to the project was with um, sharing my artwork. Um, I'm primarily a printmaking artist, and really a lot of my artwork really just comes from, stems from uh, just like sharing my family's migration stories. Um, you know, currently I am a DACA recipient, and um, you know, that, you know, I, as I was hearing you speak, you know, um, things are constantly changing. And so, of course, like right now, I'm still like making artwork and, and in some ways, like I feel like now I'm making artwork as a response to the thing, to the continuous flux of changes um, in US government policies. But um, the artwork that um, you see in the migratory uh, show specifically, right, you have um, a print uh, called like No Palazzo um, and Nobre de Nuestra Familias, which um, it's just really a piece that talks about the real um, circumstances of growing up undocumented in the United States. Um, you know, uh, most of my siblings and I grew up undocumented until um, DACA was passed in 2012 by um, Barack Obama. And so, um, you know, we were kind of, um, so the way that I see my pieces, you know, I make work, of course, as a response to things that are changing um, in uh, the U.S. government and the way that that impacts, um, of course, like my life, my family's life, um, our community's lives, but then at the same time, um, I make them really to share our stories. Um, I think it's really important that um, as an artist, like, I want to take up space to share my family's stories, my community's experiences um, in my perspective as the way that um, we are experiencing and seeing them. Um, and, you know, also to um, now, you know, just kind of um, I've discovered too, like my the the people that I sometimes draw in my works, like they're representative of family members sometimes, sometimes not. But um, when I've shown work, um, I've really seen the impact that um, it's had on my family. Like they feel seen, and they feel like our stories matter, and you know they do. And so you know, as like a visual artist, I've just really kind of it's been a journey. Um, so the pieces that um, you see in the migratory uh, show there, uh, you know, it took me a long time to really uh, embrace, I wouldn't say embrace like my story, but really just kind of take reins of it. Um, you know, putting myself out there um, can be very vulnerable at times, especially because of the way that at least like, you know, DACA is in flux right now, or at least it has been since its creation, I think. Um, but I think it's important to to create this work because it makes, like, I, I, I can't imagine um, not ever, like, I don't want it to get lost, like, in media, you know, like, there's so much going on in the world, and um, so, uh, yeah, and there's another piece in the migratory um, show where it shows, like, a family sort of kind of walking, and you see, like, the tamales in the front, and so, um, you know, besides, like specifically, like my work just talks about um, our experience of migrating, right? So my family left from, uh, immigrated from Zacatecas, Mexico, and um, came over to the United States. Um, a lot of it just had to do with uh, lack of educational opportunities. Um, there was not a lot of, like we were very impoverished. And so, you know, my dad thought it was the best way to uh, provide my family with a better chance of success. And um, well, the fact that I'm sitting here, it's kind of, I think, you know, uh, a testament to that. But then, um, uh, so the other works too, just kind of talk about like, of course, like with the journey of leaving, you have to also, um, it's very difficult to retain um, and like hold on to your like histories, your traditions. Um, and so for me, like that's very important as well. 
And um, yeah, so, and the work that is upstairs, uh, that work, um, I was invited um, by Rochelle Pablo um, to be a part of that, and um, that work just kind of, again, like talks about um, specific, like moments in my family's migration story, of course, like, of course, like the journey of um, migrating here and sort of like the, the real dangers of um, traveling through, um, you know, like the U.S. southern borderlands, but then also there's like a, a installation piece that uh, specifically talks about like my experience as a DACA individual. Um, and so, uh, yeah, that's kind of how I contributed to um, this project. And so, um, yeah, and I was just really excited uh, to hear about the project because, um, you know, I think in some ways, you know, like I use art as a way to, of course, um, to talk about what's happening um, with my community. Um, in some ways, I, I also use it as like a, like a coping mechanism in some ways. Um, but then also like, I think um, I understand like the power of like visual culture and the way that it, um, the way that it impacts like social movements. And, um, and so hopefully like my work can contribute a little bit towards that. Um, yeah. Um, so um, next I'm going to ask a question to Carol Suzuki, uh, again at, from UNM Law School. Um, Carol, I just wondered if you could provide some context about the effects of uh, some um, policies, the migrant protection protocols, otherwise known as Remain in Mexico, and Title 42 on asylum seekers um, in uh, Ciudad Juarez uh, during 2019 and 2020. Um, at the time that artist Minerva Cuevas and others were working on this exhibition. So we've, we've learned things are changing all the time, but if you could kind of bring us back to when these policies were put in place and, and the effect that that had. Thank you. So you've probably seen on TV uh, you know, children in, in cages, uh, literally, um, people trying to cross the border into the United States from Mexico. And uh, even now, most of the folks who are trying to cross over are not originally from Mexico, but they were able to make it to Mexico, make it to the southern border, and they're trying to seek protection from the United States. So they come to the entry point and they are seeking asylum. They are saying that they are being persecuted in their home state and they cannot go home because either their government is persecuting them or there is someone else or some entity persecuting them that the government refuses to stop or is unable to stop. So people are saying that the reasons why they are being persecuted are based on their race, nationality, membership in a particular social group, religion, or political opinion. So they are seeking the protection of the United States and with the migrant protection protocols and Title 42, there were attempts by the Trump administration to keep people out. So although under international and federal law, the United States should allow these folks to come in to prove their case that they should get asylum, the migrant protection protocols really doesn't, they didn't protect the migrants. Uh, so uh, there, and you'll hear different stories, but you know, what we did see in El Paso was that there would be folks who would cross over the international bridge and they would talk to uh, an agent of Homeland Security and say, I want uh, to come in and seek asylum and they would be told, you need to go back over on the other side of the bridge, and you need to go to see a woman at a church, and she has a notebook, and she will put your name down, and when your name is called, there will be a court date for you, and then you can come to court, and you can tell the judge your case, and you can try to seek asylum. So in the meantime, people were waiting in Juarez where they couldn't work, where they didn't have uh, the ability to live anywhere. They were subject to rape, murder, kidnapping, and trafficking. So uh, the 
situation was very terrible for them and uh, they were certainly reliant on organizations and churches and individuals to help them, which is why you see the migrant yellow pages that was created to provide some assistance to people in Juarez while they're waiting to come to the United States. But because of COVID in March of 2020, the hearing stopped temporarily. Uh, and, and so people were not able to uh, be seen before a judge to make their claims. So during the Biden administration, Biden has tried to stop the migrant protection <coughs> protocols, but there was a lawsuit from Texas that stopped uh, the, protection, the migrant protection protocols from being terminated uh, due to, it was, it was, the claim was it was the Biden administration didn't do the right procedural move to terminate the, the protocols. And as, as a confluence, along with the migrant protection protocols, was Title 42, which is the public health law. So during COVID, uh, the health law was put in place to uh, claim that people who might bring in a communicable disease should be kept out of the United States to protect people in the United States. But of course, you can imagine that th this uh, Title 42 was only being used against particular individuals because people who were coming from Mexico who had uh, the right to come into the United States because they were US citizens or they were green card holders, they were allowed to come in. And once the, uh, with, with COVID, we were able to do rapid testing and vaccines were available, Biden, again, tried to stop Title 42, but uh, the, uh, a different court said you cannot terminate Title 42 because you weren't going through the appropriate uh, administrative process. But what we did see yesterday was a uh, district court in Washington, D.C. said that Title 42 was enacted um, in a way that was arbitrary and capricious. So. T Title 42, uh, you know, the, the way to keep people out of the United States or to expel people from the United States um, back to Mexico or to their home countries should end. But because this was done and the Biden administration really isn't ready for it, even though the Biden administration said we want to stop it, they are now asking for five weeks of a stay so they can prepare for when Title 42 does end so that migrants can come into our borders safely. Thanks, Carol. Um, could you also tell us a little bit about what the Border Justice Initiative is about That's that you're involved with at UNM Law School? Sure. The Border Justice Initiative at the law school provides service learning opportunities for students to provide representation, assistance, and research to migrants at the southern border, particularly women and children. So with th this in initiative, uh, we were uh, graciously provided some funding to be able to uh, provide some teaching assistance, uh, externships. We have a fellowship in, in place for one graduate student to be able to develop uh, lawyers who will provide immigration work and relief at the southern border. Uh, as an example of the work that we have done, uh, last spring I and another law professor took some students down to uh, El Paso, Las Cruces, and Juarez. So in Las Cruces we went to federal district court in El Paso, we met with advocates. We went to immigration court and did some court monitoring of people who are in the MPP program who are trying to stay in the United States. And also, we went down to Juarez, and during that time, we met with an organization that provides very, it's very specific relief. So it's, it's for the LGBT community of immigrants who are trying to come into the United States. And while we were there, we also went to Penitentiary Resist and the uh, 
the printing press. So we met uh, Jorge uh, Perez, and um, he's the person who made the mosaic that's in the back. And so it's really exciting for me. It kind of came full circle because I've seen the printing press on which the Yellow Pages for Borrowers was made. So it's really exciting for me. Thanks so much, Carol. Um, so now I have some questions for, for Jessica. And um, I think, you know, Carol was kind of bringing us up to the current moment yesterday with the decision about Title 42. Um, but um, Jessica, I just wondered if you could kind of talk about the current context for asylum seekers um, in, the, um, in the border cities. Um, we're, we focus mostly with this exhibit on, on Ciudad Juarez and El Paso. Um, and then also to share information about what um, Albuquerque Faith Works uh, Collaborative, which you are the executive director of, what, how you support asylum seekers, how anyone in this room can assist, um, anything you, you think that, that people should know about. Sure. Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me tonight. Um, as all of my colleagues up here have said, immigration and our border is broken. Let's start with that premise. It's broken. The infrastructure, that sort of infrastructure that existed in Juarez when these policies were implemented um, was not prepared to accept hundreds of thousands of people. Um, the church communities, the faith communities there, um, and any of the shelters that were in place in Juarez were not able to receive all of those folks. And that's why there was so much violence, so many people on the streets. Um, you probably saw pictures of folks um, who were underneath bridges and with their mylar blankets and just uh, terribly egregious, horrific situations for all of these folks. That hasn't changed. So MPP went away, Title 42 is going to go away. It's the same scenario down on the border as it was in 2019, 2020. Um, and that's, that's on us, and by us I mean our government, um, because we forced Mexico's hand in receiving people um, for the Remain in Mexico, um, um, I guess, policy, if you want to call it a policy. It's not really, it was just an awful thing that, that our administration did at the time. And the purpose, let's be really clear, was not about protecting you and I. It was not about protecting the migrants. It was about punishing people for trying to seek asylum. That was the entire purpose of those, um, those policies, both Title 42 and Remain in Mexico. Maybe that's my opinion, but I think we share that opinion. Um, anybody who's doing this work shares that opinion. Um, so currently, um, you know, with, with the changes in Title 42, everyone is trying to prepare. We have five weeks to prepare. Um, there isn't, there's no change in the infrastructure down in Mexico, and there isn't really any, any remarkable change here in the United States um, in, in the, uh, what we call the El Paso sector and all the way up through to, to um, Albuquerque um, and further north. There's not, um, there's not this m miracle number of organizations that are are popping up everywhere that are going to be able to receive these hundreds and thousands of folks that are, are trying to seek asylum in our country. And so, um, and that also, um, a lot of the policies and a lot of the things when folks were saying things changed on, the, on a daily basis, what those of us doing this work found is that as soon as we sort of got it, as soon as we as an NGO, as a non-government organization, got an infrastructure in place and we were able to process folks and help folks get in, in into where they needed to get to with their with their sponsors. As soon as we figured it out, something changed. Also purposeful, very purposeful. So um, you know that's what we're facing and you know even though we have an administration now that perhaps has made promises about immigration reform um, and has in some ways tried to do things, there's really not a remarkable change from 2019 to today in terms of how people are suffering on the border. Um, Albuquerque Faith, Faith Works is one of, of um, just a handful of organizations that um, try to help folks who reside in our city, in our community. 
Um, there are other organizations. There's an organization called the Albuquerque Welcome, and they receive buses um, from El Paso of folks that are trying to get to their sponsors throughout the country. So they receive those buses every other week. They process 50 people. They help them get to their sponsors. That work continues. That's been uh, work in our community since 2019. At Albuquerque FaithWorks, we work with the folks that are settling here and are staying here. Um, and one of the policies also during the Trump administration said that when a person came to, to uh, make an asylum claim, they were successful in getting across the border, um, they filed their asylum claim, they had to wait 366 days to apply for a work permit. That means they couldn't work legally for 366 days. That policy has been changed, but not that long ago, um, to 150 days. But still, imagine you're, you find yourself in a new country, um, and you're looking for a place to live, and you have no way to support your family. There's no way to make money um, because you can't work. Um, and that, that policy, again, is a policy of punishment, um, what we call policies of punishment. There's a whole list of them. Um, but so for the folks that are, are here in, in Albuquerque and have been here, um, depending on when they came, some of them are still waiting for their work permits. Um, others of them do have their work permits and they're able to work and, and support themselves. In that interim period, and even after they get their work permits, our job at Albuquerque FaithWorks is to try and help them um, integrate into a community of their choice. Um, and we do that with sort of practical things like providing food, providing clothing, providing uh, case management services through a group of volunteers that help folks um, uh, get their kids enrolled in school, find a dentist, whatever it might be to help them acclimate and, and come into our community because they've chosen Albuquerque as their community um, and then communities within our community as we all are members of. Um, and so we have been in existence since 2019 um, and the asylum part of our program has been um, at Albuquerque Faith Works since 2020. Um, we are 15 different faith communities in Albuquerque. That's who is our members of our organization. And we work primarily on a volunteer structure. Um, we've grown exponentially as our social issues continue to grow in our, in our communities. Um, and so you can get involved as a volunteer. Um, we'd love to have you. Please go to our website. It is abqfaithworks.org. Um, and you can go onto our website and find out different volunteer opportunities and different ways that you can engage with folks that are living here. Um, I also do want to mention that um, we now, uh, you know, originally when we set, were setting up our organization, we were providing mostly services to people from Northern Triangle countries, maybe a couple Cubanos on occasion that would come through. Um, but we also do have Ukrainian refugees now, and we also do have Afghan um, refugees in our program. So we've been able to sort of expand a little bit to help those folks too. Um, because once again, even though our government allowed those folks to come in from those countries, they didn't provide them the structure that they really need to be able to be successful in our country. So um, we provide those services as well. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. So um, now I just want to, uh, before I open it up for questions from, from you all, I want to ask the panelists if any of you have questions for each other. Any, anything you'd like to ask? Not sure? Well, okay. Yeah, we have Mike. Um, I know you mentioned that um, 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 the community in Juarez was not prepared to welcome all these people that were coming through, and um, I completely agree with that statement. However, I feel like one of the things that surprised me the most when I started, like you know, like meeting people and going around with Minerva, was the fact that there was like so many things happening with so many different organizations that were like, had, had like so fast created a network, and it was like you know like um, international organizations that were coming from you know like the the UN or like other places that came, they opened up hotels, they created a system that was working and they were working with each other. I mean, they created like a network of uh, shelters that were put up by churches and you know, so, um, well, yeah, yeah. So, and uh, you know, like places like La Gratis Tienda where it's like a place that people go and take their, you know, like items and clothes and migrants are like take use of that because they can go and just grab stuff for free. So um, I'm not saying like we were not prepared, but what really surprised me a lot by the time that you know, like we, I started meeting all these people, it's like how fast and how efficient they 
they became, and it was like, you know, like just like from like, you know, like individuals helping out all the way to, you know, governmental institutions and organizations. So um, I just wanted to highlight that, you know, I feel like that's one of the things that really struck me the most when I started looking into that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, Juarez and El Paso is not the only border. We all know that. Um, I had an opportunity to go to Matamoros, um, which is Brownsville, Texas, Matamoros border. And that um, experience was amazing. The World Kitchen was there. Um, there were lots of different organizations providing different services. But the thing that will always stick with me is the infrastructure that the asylum seekers created themselves within the camp. So like Monday was Honduras Day and Tuesday was Guatemala Day and they would, that would, if you were from one of those countries, it was your day to cook for the whole camp, to clean for the whole camp, um, to make sure people had what they needed. Um, there was an entire barter system set up. If you were, you know, a hairdresser in Honduras, you could, people could come to your tent and they would cut your hair for tortillas or whatever it was, or whatever barter system that they could set up. So yes, absolutely. Um, I meant more the Mexican government than the Mexican NGOs because they stepped up big time, yeah. big time. Uh, anyone else um, before we open it up or want to add anything that you thought of? Okay. Well, well, I think we'll wait for questions. So um, I want to I want to thank our panelists first of all for answering all of those questions. Um, and now I just want to open it up to to the group. If if you have questions for a, a panelist for the panel, um, we have another mic. And um, yeah, so anyone wanna wanna ask a question? Don't be shy. I, um, so I was just uh, curious, I don't know if, who the right person to answer would be, but uh, so uh, in your interactions with the migrants, um, I'm just curious if you had an opportunity to see some of them having artistic inclinations. I mean, it will be fascinating to see art made by the migrants themselves. And so, yeah, just curious. So, yeah, any, anyone, Edgar? So um, a lot of the um, a lot of the things that are put in place when helping these like um, migrating communities is of course you know like you want to take care of like the their health and their like needs you know food shelter health all that but um, there's a big part of the like local community that's part of the artistic community that like you know create create workshops to go, you know, like, so there's been, like, a lot of um, artists that started teaching at sh shelters, like, you know, and, and and they do it, like, I mean, kind of like a, like a therapy thing, you know, like a way of just, like, you know, venting or, you know, doing these things. So um, you, you do see, like, you know, when, when you go to shelters or hotels where they're hosting uh, uh, people seeking asylum, you you do see a lot of these um, expressions of, of, of art, you know, and, and I feel like there, a couple of those are included in the, uh, Section Amarilla la Migración that we did in Juarez, you know, we incorporated a couple of pieces by actual migrants. But I mean, if, uh, there is like a, a, some people that are like looking into making sure that they offer also these services, you know, some, that, some of them are like, you know, they do it on a volunteer basis, but also there's like programs where people were getting paid to actually go to shelters and teach uh, classes. And um, one of them was um, Marcia Santos. Uh, she's an artist from Juarez and she was going to different, um, um, shelters and creating this, you know, beautiful like exercises with like uh, the children mostly about, you know, so it's, I mean, it, it, it's, it's part of like the, the, the system that has been created to help people, yeah. Anyone else have a question? There's a really nice show um, about a cooperative called Bordado that comes out of Anapra. I don't know if you saw that, Edgar, but these are uh, women from all over Central America that are uh, doing embroidery and they're using, um, uh, you know, sort of symbols and animal flora fauna from their homelands. And there's a whole project out there. And they're also like selling these bags to the community. They're just like simple, like moralitos and, you know, but it's, the work is fantastic. And there's a really nice show at the Museo de Arte Ciudad Juarez right now with that work. And it's, um, it's quite exceptional as a, 
art installation, not to mention a project for, you know, for women in migration. So. Thanks, Gary. Um, any other any other questions? Um, first off, I wanted to thank everyone on the panel, obviously. Um, and I really like the idea about the Yellow Pages, and I wanted to know if there's any kind of conversation with other cities or border towns um, to create projects like these for migrants in those spaces. Um, so one of the reasons why um, the decision was made to publish the book like, without authorship is so that anybody that sees the book or sees the project can like you know use that format to apply it to their community. So there's really not like you know, I don't think anyone that was involved in this process of creation had the bandwidth to actually you know push it forward. But the idea was always to create something, a platform or like a system that could be replicated in other places. So I mean, if you know of anyone that you know might be interested in doing something similar, I mean I'm pretty sure uh, the team would be more than happy to share you know like documents or ideas or, you know, the, just like the process that we went through to create something like this. So, I mean, I mean, th this is the second time that it happened. So I'm hoping that it's going to, uh, here in Albuquerque, so hoping that it's used in many other places. And I feel like that's uh, um, behind a lot of, like, you know, the work that uh, Minerva uh, uh, takes on to, you know, she likes to, like, hijack this, like, capitalist ideas of production and stuff like that to make them accessible and free and open to the public. So um, it just builds on her practice in a way, so. Um, and, and I just was also gonna mention, there there's a sample of the Albuquerque one, and I could pass that around too. This is kind of hot off the presses. Um, I think that uh, Suzanne, might tell us a little bit about the, the plans for for these yellow pages because this is now the 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 next iteration. Um, yeah, um, Viola Arduini on our staff, who's away right now, she really took the lead in this in meeting with immigrant organizations in Albuquerque and compiling all of the artist contributions and um, working in very closely with Minerva in the whole process. So. It's a smaller version here. We did it in a much shorter time frame um, than than you all did in in Juarez and El Paso. But um, basically, the the plan for distributing it is to um, to get it out to pe into people's hands, immigrants' hands, through these organizations in Albuquerque that serve immigrants. So we're not generally distributing it just to the general public randomly. It's it's really through the organizations that we're trying to get them into the hands of the people that can use them. Um, but yeah, have a look at it. It's really interesting to see all the information. It's, it's not only giving uh, resources of organizations that can help people, but it, there's a whole section on plants and what plants can be eaten or are medicinal and what plants are poisonous and very practical things for people on the ground, uh, you know, in need in the in the environment here. Yeah. Oh, Thank and you. we're also putting it up on our website, so it's available there. Great. Thanks, Suzanne. I feel like I saw a hand up over here. Yeah. Oh. Hi, I'd like to ask Juana. Hi. I wanted to know why you um, why you chose printmaking to tell your story rather than writing or painting. Why you chose printmaking? I knew somebody was going to ask that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, I I actually um, how should I start this? Well, um, I was always very like creative, like when I was younger. Um, I like to share the story because it really does kind of contextualize like why I'm an artist now. Um, but uh, when my family and I uh, migrated to the United States, um, you know, I was seven years old. Some of my siblings were a little bit older. Some of them were a little bit younger than that. Um, but for me, um, you know, like even though I was quite young, I still struggled to, um, well, first of all, like adapt to like a new environment, new culture. Um, Learning how to speak English was very difficult for me for a long time. Um, 
I always just enjoyed like drawing. Like I think at the core, like drawing is um, it just it's at the core of everything that I do in print. Um, I think of like printmaking. So like everything starts with a drawing with my artwork. Um, it's just being interpreted through print. Um, and so, um, you know, uh, so drawing became like a really um, important role in the way that I coped with um, being, well, like living in a new place. Um, but then also like, um, I also really discovered how like drawing really became a very practical way of communicating um, ideas and messages. So, um, you know, when I was in school, when, you know, I didn't know how to say something, I would just draw it and I would share it with my teachers. Um, um, I would share it with like, you know, my other classmates who, you know, knew how to speak English. So like that was like a very tangible, practical way. And so like early on, I really discovered like the power of like art in that way. Um, but then um, it took going to um, undergrad uh, to really discover printmaking. You know, I think that's just um, now being a printmaking professor, I feel like um, that's, yeah, like it's really interesting because um, like I said, so I, it took going into college to, to discover that medium. Um, and once, once I discovered like how the flexibility of print, you know, like it can be interpreted in a variety of techniques, but um, I just really love the way that you can make multiples of something. And so like the idea of making your work not only um, accessible, of course, like selling it, I guess, but for me, like I love the idea of being able to like make copies of an image and then use that to like amplify my message, like share it with multiple people. Um, and then, you know, like the works that you guys, that most of it that's here, it's like all like in lithography and lithography in print, like that's the most, um, out of all the techniques, I feel like that's the most um, direct to drawing um, out of all of them. I mean, of course, like they all kind of, you, it, you all have to, if you haven't ever made a print, you know, like you still have to, um, I guess, uh, treat the surfaces in different ways. But I mean, I guess depending on what you're trying to do, but um, but yeah, I just really fell in love with like like that drawing aspect of it. Um, print making is so process based, right? And so like you know, you have to make a drawing, and you have to transfer over the drawing to a plate, and then the plate you have to do something to it, and then you have to ink it, and then you have to print it. And like like it feels like. I love it because it's so tactile and I feel like I can touch everything um, as I'm making it. But, um, and then also too, uh, I just kind of fell in love with how bright and colorful print is, like in terms of like the ink and the amount of um, like, yeah. So I think for me, it was just, I loved how you could paint and draw and you can make multiples of something and you can, um, yeah, it just felt like it just gave me the voice that I needed. And, um, and you know, yeah, like everything starts with the drawing, but I never feel like, like drawing is just its first step. Like I don't feel like, like I can, I can have a show with my drawings, but I just don't feel like that's enough. Um, and then also too, oftentimes when I make a drawing for a print, it changes in the process. So, um, and whether that's because something went south <laughs> in the process or just simply because like my, like the more that I sit with the work and I like work through it, like also too, like my, uh, I guess like, I wouldn't say my concept changes, but the way that I think about the work changes too. So, um, yeah. Thank you. And then also too, um, you know, I, there's something, you know, like historically speaking, there's um, like printmaking um, is tied with um, political and social movements. And so for me, I was like, yeah, this is awesome. And, um, you know, I, yeah, I just love that and like being part, like I felt like I could be a part of that too, but in contemporary culture. Well, do you have a show in Santa Fe now, right? I do. Yes, so I have a, um, a solo exhibition right now at uh, Echo Amano Gallery in Santa Fe. And um, that is my first uh, solo exhibition um, right out of graduate school. So I got my uh, Master's of Fine Arts in Printmaking um, last fall, so fall of 2021. So. Um, yeah, so that's kind of been, so that's been really exciting um, just to have that opportunity, you know, like um, going through 
academia for, you know, undergrad and grad school. Like, I mean, you know, I'm thankful that the fact that I have been able to get that education. A lot of people um, in my situation haven't had access to that. So for me, like, I understand um, this, you know, like the privilege that I've had with that. Um, but uh, yeah, I guess like I'm just really thankful that I can live a life as an artist because, you know, uh, first of all, like going to undergrad at a time where I didn't think at least so, um, like I said, I, I grew up undocumented, right? So when we moved to the United States and until like 2012, um, I think that uh, a lot of people think that because you have like DACA, you can access financial assistance through the government and that's not true. Um, that's, um, people need to really get informed about that. Um, but um, so for me, like navigating how to get to school and like completing undergrad and then jumping to grad school, like I'm just really, you know, really thankful that um, I have found people who have supported me along the way with that. Um, you know, my parents, they also helped a lot with that, you know. Um, like I said, I have four, like four siblings in total and um, I'm the only one who's gotten like a, an education, like, you know, um, a college degree. And so, um, you know, that for me is like very meaningful. I know it's meaningful for my parents, um, my, you know, our family, but um, I guess like where I'm going with that is that with the show that I have in Santa Fe, like I'm just really excited that I'm like, oh my God, okay, now that I'm done with school, um, I can still keep making work and um, I don't know, it's, you just gotta go see it. <laughs> just go see it. Okay, it looks like someone behind you has their hand up. Thank you. Uh, just. I have a couple of questions, if that's okay, but the first one is sort of piggybacking on the answers that you just, uh, you gave. Um, I love what you said about the sort of democratic nature of, of the multiple in printmaking. Um, photography shares that in its medium. Um, and, you know, art's one of those things where it's, in, in one sense, it can be very democratic and it's, it's a medium of people, but it's also um, a medium that can be very elite and so I was wondering if you guys, and this is a question for all of you, if you could speak to sort of the nature of, of how art operates in the process of, of migrant experience. And so like, like pre and post, like there and here, like how art operates in that experience, like uh, experiencing art, processing art, using art. And then maybe more specifically, if you guys, I know that uh, you spoke about this a little bit, but how maybe Yellow Pages is interfacing uh, with migrants in the process, in the way it was designed. I'm just curious as to how that um, gets to people and what that looks like. It's an honor, yeah. I'm happy to be here and thank you guys for speaking on this. Um, I think it's really important. Um, I feel like that's a very long question and I, I'm gonna do my I'm best I'm really to, sorry. No, 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 it's, I'm gonna do my best to uh, answer to what I think you're asking. Um, I think at least so for me, like I said, um, because of my background and upbringing, I think that for me it is a privilege to be an artist. Um, you know, like I said, I'm the only one in my family who has gotten a college degree. And so um, I know my parents wanted me to be, um, to get a, I don't know, to be a lawyer, to be a doctor, to be um, a profession, like to be a part of a profession where it makes money, makes a little bit, you know, like have stability in that way. Um, so, you know, like for me, I feel like I am in a position of privilege. Um, and then also too, like printmaking, you know, like the type of prints that I'm making, I need a press, I need a studio. So like that also too, like comes into play. Um, but I think that, um, and I don't know, like, um, anybody can like be an artist. Like, I don't, I, I guess it depends on like, I don't, I don't know. I'm going to like do my best, but, um, so. I can anyone could, could be an artist. Could. I think so. If you can, yeah. if you can Have make. You me draw? It no. Can you make? Can you make a mark and hold the tool? Yes, but that's not the eyes that you're talking about. Your eyes are like beautiful. Well, thank you. I well, you know, I think that. Um, but I've had, I guess, training, right? So there's like that like aspect, another layer of that. But 
Um, I don't know. I, I hope that like answers the question. I don't feel like I did, but um, but yeah. I, and I guess like um, I think the important part about like art making is just making it accessible. Like that's really important to me. Um, and whether that's and like for me too, like it's also just really important to just put the work out there. Um, I know like lately I've been showing in all the like galleries and like museums and things like this. Um, but for me too, like. I share a lot of my artwork online because that's free, right? If you um, if you have access to a phone, like that's um, that's the way that I think also about accessibility. Like I um, don't have like I'm not afraid to share like how I make art, how I share my process. I think sometimes as um, artists, like especially if you start to get really good at something and maybe you developed it on your your own, you get you kind of want to hold on to it and not show people. Sometimes at least I've run into people like that. Um, not everybody, of course, but um, I think that's another way that I think about accessibility. Um, yeah, I don't. I hope that like answers the question. Um, Would you guys? Do you guys well, have I any answer to that? Edgar, if you had any comments just um, to follow yeah. to follow up on that. Yeah, it's, it's a little. Um, I I think I didn't grasp grasp like the totality of the question, but it made me think um, about um, how recently. A lot of artists have turned their practice into like socially engaged practices, in which um, um, the artist kind of like becomes more like a facilitator than an actual creator, and like the art is not really like a, like an end, like a, an object at the end that you're you're looking for, but like the actual process of working within these communities be becomes the artwork itself, and I feel like that's. Uh, reflected in a lot of like different practices. Um, I mean, all around the world in the past, you know, maybe like I don't know, three decades or more. You know, you can make an argument that before than that, but um, but I think about um, like an an experience that I had maybe like three or four years ago with a friend. Um, her name is Aida Alonso, and she's a jeweler, and she creates these like beautiful pieces. And she got a grant to work with um, uh, detainees in El Paso, and she got. Um, permission to go to uh, different um, um, detention centers and give workshops to the people that were working there. And like, you know, it was like back in the day and I didn't really understand, you know, she was just going there, giving workshops. It was great to like see people, you know, take some time away from like, you know, their situation and, you know, create this art pieces. And at the end she had an exhibition and I'm going to be very fair. Like in my mind, this exhibition was like, oh, like this is not what I imagined like a, a, an exhibition would look like because it felt a little incomplete. Like things weren't framed properly, you know. Like I mean, like it's, it was just like this like community exhibition that was put up, and it took me some time to realize that the artwork, like during that time, I mean, yeah, it was like you know the drawings and stuff like that, but in reality, like the art was actually going to the centers and talking to the people and having them, having them, you know, like ex have this experience of creation. Um, so I feel like that's what's happening when um, with these different practices. It happens like a lot in. Juarez and in El Paso, you know, like um, when, when you're, you know, working with communities to try to like, you know, create some positive change. Uh, uh, the final object is not the most important one. It's just like, you know, what happens in the process of creation here. I, I had a, another thing to add to your question. Um, when we started this process of partnering with organizations on the other side of the border, our, uh, one of our lead partners there, Leon de la Rosa Carrillo, he, um, he came up from Juarez when we started this project, Species in Peril, along the Rio Grande in 2019. And he came and met with us and invited us to come down to Juarez and talk to people there and um, engage in the dialogue and help develop the project. And, and we did, we came down and that meant so much to him because he really stressed that like in the contemporary art world, there's so many um, museums and institutions that are doing projects about the border and it's a very hot topic, but they don't actually cross over and go there. They, they're doing it from afar. And so he expressed how meaningful it was that we actually went there and um, so I just wanted to mention that that um, this process, the Deserto Mountain Time collaboration and migratory and this cross-border collaboration, it's it's a really interesting way of working and it's um, 
it's so nourishing to people on both sides of the border to be able to make the border more fluid through arts and culture. And that, um, um, I guess that's, that's all I wanted to say. Uh, so uh, the organization United We Dream, they have recently started a new project um, called uh, Immigrant Made, um, where they are collaborating with artists and writers to make publications, kind of like, I wouldn't say like as practical as like um, the Yellow Pages per se, but um, it's really just a collection of just like writing and like visuals, um, drawings, uh, photographs that uh, um, where the artists are like migrants, like they identify in that in that sphere, um, and I uh, was so like I they just recently published a second edition of that um, that's also available online. It's free. They'll send you a free copy of it if you want one. You just have to request it online. Um, but um, I was recently um, invited to be a part of like the second edition as just like the illustrator part of that. Um, but um, I think that was just like a, I don't know, like I've seen like a growth in like scene culture and like making these like tangible, like accessible like book forms. Um, and for me that like makes me excited. Um, the Immigrant Made uh, project though um, is specifically like made by and for um, people who um, either like identify like as undocumented, part of the migrant community and experience. Um, and you guys should really check it out. It's really awesome. Um, and the way that it worked was, you know, like visual artists were paired with writers. And so we were um, asked to collaborate with each other to, um, in a, I guess in a sense, like as a visual artist, like bring the, the words to like life in a visual like way, um, what, which was uh, honestly like really, um, like that was really nice. But I think what was, what I found really fruitful from it was like being in a community, like being um, invited to be a part of a group um, for, um, just like to hold space with each other. Um, that's something that I, I think I really enjoyed. And um, yeah, you guys should check that out. So I also might not be answering your question, but your, your statement one about art being a, a privilege, it, it makes me think a, a, another way that sort of this exhibit sort of brings together the immigration work that I do uh, so I've represented clients from all around the world who have fleed their country because of their art. Um, people who are poets, people who use printing presses to print newspapers that the government did not like, people who had beautiful art and were being persecuted. And we all know, like Ai Weiwei, for example, people who want to and are compelled, right, by their souls to produce art, yet they are not able to. And just think about the, the privilege that we have to be able to do art here, make art, be creative, and uh, do this it, it, at times in protest of our government. Uh, so I, I think that, yeah, this, you know, this exhibition really does show um, people who are, are protesting and people who are compelled to show what it is that is inside of them and um, you know their their need to produce art and to be able to exhibit and to, sh to teach others and I think we benefit from that hi thank you for all this this is wonderful I have a question that's a little bit more um, long range. Uh, we just finished watching the horrific Ken Burns series, U.S. and the Holocaust. It's hard, hard to watch. And I think about this country, and we say, oh, the immigration system is broken. That's the surface. The thing that's broken is at the people level, it seems to me. If you've got so many people that can that can be riled up by someone saying, worried about white replacement, you know, all of this crap that they've generated. How, how do we move forward on that? How do we reach, I mean, here we are the converted, right? How do we talk to the people? How do we reach the people who are afraid? 
which is where so much of this uh, backlash and resistance and the back and forth of immigration law is that back and forth between be generous, you know, be Emma Lazarus, be the open gate, and not in my country, not in my culture, you know, go away. That, how do we, how can we talk to that other voice in America? Thank you for that question, David. <laughs> it's just a little tiny one. Um, I think this exhibit, I think telling the stories, whether that's through an art form, whether that's through having an opportunity to speak to a church community about what, what is, what's Immigration 101, um, educating people. I mean, we as human beings fear what we don't know. Um, that's sort of the human condition. And through art, through telling the stories, I mean, I get an opportunity. I, I don't have the live ex lived experience, certainly not an artist, but I have the opportunity to tell the stories of the folks that we help almost daily um, to anybody that will listen to me. So and that's what we need to do. And all of you sitting here can tell those stories too because you participate in things like this and in other um, forums where you're learning and we just need to keep talking, tell the stories through art, through writing, through verbal communication. Um, it's, all, it's all we can do and um, pushing up against, you know, Holocaust deniers, for example, in your, in your example. Um, and the Ken Burns of the world telling their story through that medium. Um, he's an amazing guy, and that was very hard to watch, especially as a person who's Jewish. So, um, it, it, yeah, tell the stories. Just keep telling the stories. Yeah, that's a very, like, I mean, it's like the question of the century you know, or like, you know, or like maybe of humanity in general, but I think one of the things that we have to realize or what, that I've been like, you know, thinking about is that these people that are, that have like so much hatred and are like so upset, um, there's like a certain, I feel like, I, I feel like there's like a certain amount of uh, lacking in their lives. You know, there's like, they're not getting their needs fulfilled um, at a state or level, you know, I mean, the you know, like economically and politically, they're not being paid attention to and, you know, their economy is being broken and, you know, it's people that have like lost their industries that they have, you know, relied on like throughout, you know, generations. So this creates like a vacuum of people that are mad and they're like struggling and they don't know where to like place that. So until those people get those needs fulfilled, there's always going to be the opportunity for politicians to come and tap into that anger and use it for political reasons and push it towards other people that like, you know, migrants or other minorities that we have in the country. So I feel like it's important to understand that this anger is coming from a place of pain and need. And until that doesn't get fixed, there's always gonna be that opportunity for redirecting that anger, and I feel like that shows a lot right now. And I, I, I mean, yeah, it's without getting too political, but I feel like that's a big part of the problem. Oh, I actually wanted to add one. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, and I think too, like I, I think I yes, yes to both um, answers. Um, but I think it is important to amplify stories, amplify information, um, because. Uh, I have met people who um, who have been like on that spectrum of I would say they're very they were very like unaware like the realities of what people face um, uh, while they're like seeking asylum, um, being forced to like live undocumented in the United States, and um, you know I don't know like as a person who can't vote it makes me very angry when people who can vote don't vote. Um, and, you know, so there's like that aspect, but then also to, um, yeah, like sharing like information is really important. Um, I guess like not to like go too into it, but um, yeah, I've, I used to work at a place where um, 
uh, it was predominantly just uh, white customers. They never really got to, see, well, to be honest, like I don't think they've ever seen a lot of brown people. Um, and so there was like a lot of, like I would just like be pouring people's coffee and just, you know, doing my job. And I would hear just a lot of really messed up, um, I would say very uninformed views about both like their, um, like immigration perspectives of like wh like what's happening in the country and um, and then it just got to the point where I was like actually you're wrong and that <laughs> made me uncomfortable it, it, of course it makes you vulnerable um, but um, I don't know I guess like I discovered that with some of those uh, people they were like oh wow like I think seeing someone who's affected by these policies, by these experiences, like it really does matter. Um, and I'm not saying that like it was easy for me because it is uncomfortable. Like I don't want to talk to random people about my situation. Um, and I guess in some ways I do that with my art, but um, like being confronted with people like in person, like that's one thing, right? Like um, and then like putting the artwork out there and letting people imp interpret it, um, like that's another thing, you know. But uh, so that was so I think it is important to talk about these things and. Um, I think that there is, like, as, mu as much as, like, there's people who are angry and don't want to, um, I guess, support, like, reforms, like, my, like um, immigration reforms, I think there's a lot of people who can do, like, who can and want to. Um, I don't really know what's the answer, but people just need to, um, you know, like, share information. Um, that's what's really important, right? And um, I haven't seen like the docu series that you mentioned. I'm gonna go look it up. I'm gonna go inform myself. Um, and uh, okay, <laughs> I will. I'll try to prepare myself for that. Um, but yeah, like just sharing information is very important, um, and we just can't stop doing that. We just can't um, because, like, it's uh, like what we just heard. You know, there's things that are continuously changing. And um, yeah, it's exhausting to keep up with that stuff. You just can't lose steam. I can't, you know, you can't. Um, so, and both. Just um, thank again the panelists for um, sharing so much with us this evening. I wanna thank you all for coming out on a very cold Wednesday evening. Um, to be part of this conversation. Um, so I want to, I'm going to start the clock. Up and, I, and I do think we are at the end of our time, but if you haven't seen the exhibitions, um, please come back. Um, they're, they're wonderful exhibitions, and there's an exhibition catalog. If you haven't checked it out yet, we have some, cop some copies of the Yellow Pages. Albuquerque, if you'd like to look at them, they're just samples. Um, again, I'd love to, like to thank Suzanne Sparge, Carrie Doyle, everyone else who, um, who basically made this all happen here at 516 Arts. Thank you.